Well, now we move forward a little further into the structuring. We're assuming now the church is growing, you've got maybe multiple cell groups, and you've got different age groups, and uh, different needs are beginning to be identified that, that maybe need to be addressed. And so you begin to expand the ministries of the churches as God has opened up opportunities of you identified needs, and you empower the local people to lead those ministries. So at this point, you may also formally call uh, leaders or elders to make that a formal leadership team. Uh, you initiate those new ministries and structures that are going to meet those needs. We find this in uh, really in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, don't we? Remember the early church was meeting in Jerusalem, and um, they were caring for the widows. There were needs that needed to be met. There were widows that didn't have provision, and so food was being distributed among the widows. But remember what happened? There was a conflict. And the Greek-speaking, these were all Jewish believers, but there were Greek-speaking uh, widows, and then there were the Hebrew-speaking widows. And uh, there was a tension. Some were thinking, well, they're getting more of the food than we are. And you're giving preference to that group. Yes, even in new churches, the conflict, even in the New Testament, there were some conflicts. And these were ethnic conflicts. The question we had before about, well, what about different groups that don't get along? Well, we see that right in the early church. So the elders are kind of now saying, okay, we've got this need, we've got a problem, the distribution of food, and the leaders are saying, man, there is just so much to do, we're, we're overwhelmed. So what did they do? They created a new ministry team, a new structure to meet that need. And those were the deacons. And so they said, they gotta be spiritual people, we're not just taking anybody, spiritual people that will now be the deacons, and they, because why? Because now they said, the apostles should be devoted to the teaching of the word and prayer. So they began to specialize their priority in prayer and in preaching and teaching. But then they created a new ministry that would take care of this particular need, the distribution of food. And so they created a new ministry. And it's no surprise then that as they took care of that need, they addressed the conflict they didn't avoid the conflict. They didn't sweep it under the carpet. They addressed the need. They created a new ministry to address that need. And then it said they presented these deacons to the apostles. They prayed and laid their hands on them. So there was a public recognition of this new ministry. And then verse 7, So the word of God spread and the numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And I think in the book of Acts, we keep seeing these statements about how the church grew and the word of God spread. This is one of those points. And, and I believe Luke puts those little growth statements at very strategic points as he's telling the story. And I think right here, he's making a point that when the church addresses the needs, when the church finds new ways to meet those needs, when the church has both the priority of prayer and teaching the word, as well as meeting people's physical and emotional needs, and creates a structure to do that, God put his hand of blessing on the church, and the church grows. And I think that if the apostles had not dealt with that issue, there could have been division in the church, there would have been conflict, the cause of Christ would have been set back, the apostles would have been overwhelmed. They would have probably experienced what we call burnout in the modern day language. But they found a way, God led them to create new structures. And this is what can start happening at this phase of the church. If things are growing and the leaders are feeling more and more the burden of, of ministry growing and the needs of the people and finding those new ways. So whether it's deacons or it's a new ministry team or whatever that is, you create those and you train up the people to do it. So it's not just the same leaders, the same people now just taking on more and more responsibility. And as new people are coming in, you're assimilating those new people into the life of the church. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Evaluate, how is the church developing? Are we developing in a healthy way? Sometimes things are happening so quick that we don't have time to sit back and evaluate where are the needs? Are we developing healthy what do we need to address? 
And in some places you will organize the church legally at this point. You have installed leaders that are recognized leaders. You have a structure. And so it may be at this point you say we will officially organize, register with the government, um, whatever the appropriate way of formalizing the existence of the church is where you are. And the goal here is to have full financial autonomy. So if this church was somehow being financially subsidized, or maybe there were or foreign funds coming in, maybe there was a, a missionary that, uh, or a church planner that was being supported by another church, the idea here is to develop that church to where it's able to financially be autonomous. Why? Because as long as it's still dependent, it's not going to really be in a place to start new churches. They're still receiving help. How can they really begin to launch others if they're still dependent? So the idea here is, again, local sustainability so that then they can begin to launch others. So here the role of the church planner becomes multiplying. So I'm training others who then can train others to do ministry because these ministries are beginning to expand. And so many churches reach a bottleneck in their growth because they have not learned how to mobilize new workers and they've not learned how to create new ministry and ministry structures to meet people's needs. If you have a church where people have needs, so whether the widows who are not being, being served properly or whether there are um, other spiritual needs or emotional needs in the church that are not being addressed, the church is going to suffer. So that's going to be the critical feature at this phase. Well, now we kind of come to that point where we talk about multiplying. Now remember what we said. Multiplication of disciples, leaders, cells, that is hopefully going along the whole way. Uh, so now we're talking about multiplying the church and really reproducing churches, not just disciples, leaders, and cells. So now strengthening and sending is the idea. So we want to sustain evangelistic thrust. Many times a church plant, it's a lot of work. It's hard work, and you've got a lot of new believers now, and these new believers, they come with all kinds of issues and concerns and, and maybe counseling, and so you're investing more and more energy in caring for the believers. And what can happen is a couple of things. One, the energy now becomes inwardly focused, so you lose your evangelistic thrust outward. Now, sometimes there's a season in the life of the church where you have to focus on the needs of these new believers because they're overwhelming. But you can't let it stay there. You've got to come to that point where your outward focus happens again. That's one thing, the inward focus. The other thing is you can become comfortable and say we've worked so hard to get this church going and now we've finally got you know, our ministry going, we're finally paying our bills, we've finally got a place to meet. Whew. <laughs> and so you sort of sit back and just say, let's, let's just keep the sheep in the pen happy. Let's just keep the ministry going. Um, and you're kind of getting tired, you don't have the energy to say, let's start something new. And that's going to be a danger. And so sustaining that momentum and outward focus is going to be a key here. Preparing that church for reproduction. Where would be that location? You know what we did when we started some of our churches? When we started in Ingolstadt, for example, uh, the church we were planting, when we had our very first leadership weekend where where we hadn't even started Sunday services. We were just had our, building our team. Already we were praying and saying, God, where might be our first daughter church? People are going, what? We haven't even started this church yet. How, you know, now you're talking about starting another church already. I said, well, yeah, this is just a vision, but where might God have us start another church? And so I said, well, the next city up the river is Neuburg on the Donau, on the Danube River. Okay, well, someday maybe God will open that door. So we just kind of had that as a goal. Later on in the church, it was actually after I left, they started a daughter church in Neuburg. But see, the seed had been planted way back in the beginning. And an interesting thing happened. I had mentioned that we'd done evangelistic efforts and we did a tent evangelization and, and there were a number of people who came to the Lord. Guess what town some of those first believers came from Neuburg. So early along, we'd been kind of praying about that. And then in our first major evangelistic thrust, some of the first people were from that very town we'd been praying about. And guess what? The leaders in that church 
they were some of the people who became believers at that first evangelistic effort and now they're leading that church in Neuburg, that daughter church. And so sometimes you plant those seeds very early along and then you let in God's timing and God's working that door open up. And this is where that can happen in that phase. So the role here is to be then that multiplier to the memory where eventually that church planter either moves on or takes a, a role of facilitating reproducing more churches in that area. Let me just uh, mention one more thing uh, in conclusion of this section on developmental phases and that is to emphasize the different spiritual gifts that are required for these different phases. Um, now hopefully in your Blanche team you have people with a number of different spiritual gifts because no one has all the gifts. Um, so let's just go through these. Now in the launching, establishing, structuring, multiplying phases. And then of course as you launch a new church that starts in the new church all over again. In launching you need people who are evangelists and they have that apostolic kind of gift which is uh, not like the 12 apostles but sort of that a pioneering leadership visionary I need to build on no other man's foundation or preach Christ where he's not been known you need those kind of people and you need at least some that have some gift of evangelism why because that's how you build the church and if you don't lead people to Christ there's nobody to disciple later and there's no church so you need evangelist apostle type people but as you begin to gather, then it becomes more important to have that teacher, the counselor, because people are new believers, they have these needs, they come from broken families, they have addictions, and they don't know what it means to live as a Christian, they've got all these personal issues. I mean, that's what happens when you lead a lot of unbelievers to Christ. They come with all their little personal issues, right? And so the problem is evangelist apostle types they're saying, hey, let's go win some more people for Christ. Let's go conquer a new mountain. It's like, what's, what's the problem with you people that got all these personal problems? Get, get, get with it. Let's just go. And they don't necessarily have that concern to nurture and, and care for these issues as much. So you need people that have that kind of a gifting and love to do that. And you need the teachers who are, are going to give the people the solid uh, meat of the word and help them get established in their faith. Well, then as a church begins to grow, as we said, it needs to have structure and you need to launch new ministries. And that's where you need this gift of ruler manager. People just kind of know how to organize things. Now, sometimes people who are the counselor types or the teacher types, they're just more into people relational things. They're not the organizer types, right? But you need those people who know how to structure things, how to do budgets and how to... How to um, uh, just do what needs to be done to expand ministries in a meaningful way. Well, then when you get down to launching again and multiplying and starting a new church, then you need the evangelist apostle type again. Now here's my observation, and I've seen this unfortunately over and over again. Because the lead church planter doesn't have all the gifts, the church will tend to, to stay wherever that person's gifts are. So if that person is really an evangelist apostle type, it doesn't really get to a real strong church because you don't have the gifts of teaching and counseling and helping people grow strong in their faith. And people become frustrated after a while because they say, we've got these needs and, and that person just wants to go out and evangelize and start new things. And, but we have needs that aren't being met. And then the, there can be a tension and frustration in the church. Or the other thing can happen. The church planner is really more of a teacher, counselor. And so as soon as that church kind of gets up and going, the emphasis shifts to teaching and caring for the sheep. And like we said, then you lose the outward focus. And the church kind of just sits there for a while. It doesn't grow. Um, so um, you have to be sure. You say, well, gee, if the church planner doesn't have all the gifts, what do you do? Well, you either recruit people on your team that do have those gifts, but better yet, you look for people in the church of those new believers who do have those gifts. Remember Apollos? He was a new believer from uh, Ephesus that was discipled and then sent. And he was more the teacher type. 
Or you have a, a Priscilla and Aquila who actually discipled Apollos. Now, Paul didn't do that. Um, and so he had those kind of people on the team that could do that type of discipling. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. So here's a few questions for you to be thinking about as application. Examine the various phases of your church where its development is and discern where it's at. What steps are necessary to take your church to the next level? Has it gotten stuck at one of those points and is not really developing further to be healthy and to be reproducing? And to look at yourself and say, what are your spiritual gifts and where do they fit in the healthy development of a church? Maybe you're not that pioneering evangelist type, but you are maybe more of the organizational manager type and that's where your gifts really fit. And so you bring yourself, apply yourself to that. And uh, you rejoice at the, those who have other gifts. You find your niche in the development of the church. 